Hi folks, in this video I want to talk to you about the uh, interview process of getting into a large software company. I will talk specifically about Google because uh, I went through the Google interview process and I got hired by Google. I worked there for uh, about a year and while I was there I also interviewed others um, to, to get into Google and um, I noticed that while interviewing for other companies like uh, Twitter or Facebook or Amazon, the interview process is quite similar to Google. So uh, what I say here applies to, to most of these companies. So I'm going to go through uh, what kind of questions they ask uh, and then uh, what you need to study in order to be able to do well there and what you should pay attention to basically to, to perform well in your uh, Google interview. Okay, so let's get started. Um, First, I want to talk about the various positions that you can apply for at Google, and um, there are basically um, basically three kind of positions in terms of uh, level, and these are the, the first one is going to be uh, an internship, so an internship, but not any kind of internship, but the uh, the step internship. So that's the lowest level um, inside Google. We call this uh, level one. And this kind of level, I recommend it if you can get that internship. I recommend it because the interview is going to be much easier for you. Um, if you if you get accepted as a step intern, this is going to be a three months position during the summer, and um, you will have great prospects of uh, doing another internship with a company. So if you if you make it into your first step internship, then <clears throat> you can get a proper internship in the uh, in the next season. The bad thing about STEP is <clears throat> its um, its salary is slightly lower uh, than the full internship and you can only apply to this if you are a first year computer science student. Sometimes they also accept second year. So if you are just starting a computer science degree and you just finished your first year or maybe your second year, then this is what you should apply for. This, this is what I highly recommend doing because once you get into Google you will see the culture inside of it. Um, and uh, you, you will be able to see if you like it and if you want to apply again. So again, um, first uh, or second year uh, is the summer and it's also uh, three months. Okay, and then the, the second kind of uh, position you can apply for is a full internship. And the full internship is uh, available to all students studying, studying computer science. You can be a an undergrad, first or second year, or higher year. You can be a master's student, you can be a uh, PhD student. Um, and um, this is a level two inside of Google. And this is also easier to get into than a full-time position. But, uh, but this interview is going to be slightly harder than the internship. So I highly recommend if you plan to work, work full-time for Google to go through the internship because you will be able to work for a short, short amount of time. You will be able to see the interview process. You will be able to meet people there and see the company culture. And that will give you a huge advantage if you want to get a, a full-time position. And so this is uh, higher years. You can also get a full internship if you are first or second year. But... I don't, I don't recommend that because the step internship is, is easier to get into, so why not take advantage of that? Um, the internship is usually three months, uh, maybe up to a year. Sometimes you can do up to a year. For example, uh, Twitter does uh, up to a year internships. Uh, and then this, is, uh, this can be the summer or it can be during the winter. Uh, and then the, the third kind of position you can apply for is a, a full-time position. So, uh, level three. And then, um, this is usually long term. So another reason why you can do uh, an internship is that you can stay there for three months and then you can go back to school and no questions are asked about why did you leave uh, after just three months, right? So um, the, the bad thing about the full interview is of course it's more challenging. So these are the, um, the types of interviews that um, that you should expect right so I'm going to talk about all of them <clears throat> they are uh, not very different the, the basic ideas are are the same so um, what what is what is the interview what is the interview about so um, 
first of all, the Google interview is not uh, like a laid back interview. It's a very technical interview. So you will be asked technical questions and these are going to be about coding. These are going to be about systems. They're going to be about science and engineering. They're not going to talk about uh, things like um, your CV so much. You may spend like five minutes at the beginning talking about your CV and what you did. Uh, they're not going to ask open-ended silly questions like uh, what do you want to be in five years or what's your biggest weekends? We we can weakness. They don't care about such things. They care about your technical ability. So while you're there, your interviewer wants to know if you know your stuff, if you know what you're talking about. So they're going to ask you a technical question. The interview is going to last for um, 45 minutes and it will, be, um, it will be a problem. So it will be a technical problem. You will be asked a problem, you will be given a problem uh, and then you will be asked to solve that problem. And that's the whole interview. And um, there they will expect you to write code during your interview, not just to talk through the solution at a high level, but uh, you will be expected to write code at a whiteboard. So code at whiteboard. Now this is the first point um, that I want to make. If you have not used a whiteboard to code ever, this is going to be challenging. Even if you are a good programmer, the whiteboard coding session is hard. Um, so if you have taught programming lessons to others and have written on the whiteboard, that's going to be a big advantage for you. But if you haven't, then you should train. You should put aside two weeks before your interview and do coding on the whiteboard every day. And make sure that the code that you write on the whiteboard is properly written, it's actual code, it compiles and runs without mistakes. So this is important, it must compile and must run. So you're not expected to write pseudocode. You're expected to write actual code as you would write on a, on a computer and you don't get the chance to compile it. You don't get the chance to test it using a proper compiler. Now, um, the Google positions are two, two different positions, two different types of positions. The first position is called an SWE, SWE, which means uh, software engineer. And the second type of position is an SRE and that's a, a site reliability engineer or a system administration or um, DevOps. Uh, so if you, if you want to apply as a software engineer, this is what I'm going to talk about today, the software engineering position uh, interview. And um, I want to say that these are generalist interviews. So Google will not interview you for one particular position. If they want you to work on Google Maps, they will not interview you for a Google Maps position. They will interview you in general for getting into Google and then afterwards they will ask you to join a particular team or uh, you may also be given the choice of uh, joining one team or the other. So um, let's make sure that this is clear as well. This is a, a sysadmin position or reliability engineer. In the SRE position that I'm not going to talk about today, you are a sysadmin who also writes code. So this is like a DevOps position where you get to own systems, you deploy them, you automate things. Um, but um, my my interview uh, was SWE. So I interviewed as a SWE and I interviewed people as SWE, so I'm going to talk about that today. And um, the important thing is here is that the keyword is generalist. So you may be asked very general questions for uh, a wide area of different problems. You may be asked to solve whatever problem the interviewer has in mind, they can be various, and uh, your specialization does not matter so much. So if you're very good at security, for example, or if you're a very good cryptographer, this doesn't matter if you're not very good in uh, like a wide, vari wide variety of, of areas. So you, sh you should know your stuff, you should know generally uh, about computer science and um, have a general idea about how system works, how systems work. Um, not just specific knowledge. Okay, so that's like the preliminaries and then um, let's, get, let's get into the actual interviews. There's, um, there's two types of interviews. Um, the types of interviews uh, that happen at Google are screenings and then uh, there's also the, the actual on-site interviews. So there's the phone screen 
and the on-site interview. So uh, these two types of interviews are all on the same subjects. They will not be very different, but uh, I want to just briefly touch on uh, what they are so that you feel comfortable during, during their, their uh, interviews. So the, the phone interview is something that they do first. They call you up either on Hangouts or uh, on your phone and they ask you uh, a few questions. It's about an hour um, or maybe 45 minutes to an hour and it's uh, a technical interview. Like I said before, all, all of Google's interviews are technical and this one's going to be easier. So this is just to um, to see if, they, if it's worth it taking you on site basically. And you may, you may do one or two, one or two of these. If on the first one they're unsure, they'll give you a second call. And if you're an intern or a step intern, maybe all of your interviews are going to be phone screens. So uh, they, if, if you're far away, if you're in a different country, they may not bring you on site for the interview. They may conduct the, um, the other interviews on site. So for your internship, you may get like uh, two screenings, for example. If you're interviewing for, for um, full time or if you live in a country where um, Google is located and they can bring you on site easily, they uh, will also do uh, an on-site interview. If you're interviewing full-time, usually if you do well on the phone screening, they will uh, fly you to a Google office and you can do the on-site interviews there. So uh, for all, on the rest of this video, I will focus on the on-site interview, which is on the same subjects basically that uh, they're going to do on the phone screen, but this one is just uh, a little bit harder. So there's not much difference between the two in terms of subject, it's just the difficulty that is uh, that is different. So um, yeah, the the on site the on site interview is going to be a local interview. You walk into the Google office, you get your flight paid for by Google and uh, a hotel, and then in the morning you go to work. Basically, you go to the Google office. It's a nine to five interview, or maybe ten to five. It's um, it's a full day. And it's going to be um, maybe five interviews back to back. So each of these is going to be 45 minutes. And um, you're going to also get a lunch interview, which is basically a bonus interview where you get to eat lunch with a Googler and they don't ask you technical questions. So maybe it's going to be two, two or uh, maybe three interviews before lunch. Then it's going to be lunch and then two interviews after lunch, something like that. And the, the lunch interview you shouldn't worry about because um, it's not counted towards your score. Uh, of course, I mean, don't say something very stupid. Don't, uh, don't make your host feel, feel very uncomfortable or don't say something uh, racist or sexist. But um, other than that, um, if, if you're uh, you know, a normal person, uh, it shouldn't matter to you. You're not being judged on it, right? Um, so um, yeah, that's it. And then uh, let's move on to what these other technical interviews are, what these on-site interviews are, what are what are the subjects of these interviews, um, and what do they ask, and how can you do well there? So um, let's see. Let's uh, fill in the whiteboard. Um, okay, so you will be judged on three different things. They will ask you maybe different types of questions to to judge you on three different areas, three different areas. The first one is going to be coding, what we call coding. And I will explain in detail what, what this means. The second one is going to be algorithms. And the third one is going to be design. So algorithms and the third one is going to be design. Okay, so I will go more deeply into these things mm, one by one. So let's, uh, let's start by coding. Um, well, in coding, you, um, the, the interview wants to know if you can code, if you can write code, because this is what you're going to be doing at Google day to day. As a SWE, this is, this is your job, to, to write code. So uh, they will expect you to be able to code proficiently. proficiently. And um, that means you should write good code. Um, they want you to code quickly. So don't take the whole like 45 minutes to write a for loop and then um, without mistakes. 
uh, what does without mistakes mean? Well, that means the code you write on the whiteboard should uh, compile, it should not have missing semicolons, it should not have um, off by one errors. Uh, I mean, you will not be um, you will not be rejected for that, but it makes a good impression if you can uh, if you can write it well. And then, in general, they will want to see if you use uh, if you use good practices. Um, so, what are these good practices? Well, um, they could be, for example, defensive programming to uh, to use asserts in your code to check your inputs for correctness. Um, maybe uh, maybe you can ask the interviewer if they want you to write unit tests or other tests, and they can tell you uh, yes or no. Um, but it shows that you know you uh, you are testing your software, um, and then um, of course um, quickly is a bit of a misnomer because if you code too quickly, then that's a red flag. Um, the the problem is if if they ask you a coding question, it will sometimes be vague. It will be something like, um, um, I don't know, um, to implement something like, uh, ah, let's say uh, you are given some points on a map and you want to find whichever points are closest. All right. This problem statement is not clear. They, it doesn't tell you closest to what. It doesn't tell you how many points there are on the map. It doesn't tell you if the map is 2D or 1D or 3D. It doesn't tell you if the coordinates of the map are given in longitude or latitude, or if they're given in X and Y. It doesn't tell you if the coordinates of the map um, fit in memory, all these things. So um, the first thing to do when you see a coding problem is before you go in too quickly to write the code, you should think about the question and think if it is clear. And if it is not clear, you should ask as many questions as, as to clarify the problem statement. So try to figure out what the statement is asking before you go to the whiteboard to write code. You should ask questions about uh, the data. Does the data fit in memory? Does it fit on the hard drive? Sometimes Googlers enjoy um, making uh, asking you scalability questions. So maybe the data will not fit in a single server and you will have to use multiple servers. Um, and uh, you should definitely understand the problem from an algorithmic point of view. So what is the input and what is the output you should expect, right? So ask questions. This is very important. And uh, you're judged on that because during your job, um, you will need to ask questions and you will need to talk with your colleagues about various problems and you will need to discuss them. And so um, this is a good quality to have as, as a software engineer. You want to be able to, um, to explain your thought process you want to be able to explain your questions and if something isn't clear you should not be afraid to ask so just ask away and once the problem is very clear in your mind and once you know how to solve it you should then go to the whiteboard and code but um, if you're not sure how the problem is solved um, I think you should talk about the algorithm with your interviewer as you would with a colleague so tell them about your idea um, on how to solve the problem. Say, okay, I will, I will write this for loop and I will do such and such. Uh, in the same way you would talk to one of your co-workers or one of your fellow students at school. And if it seems to be uh, going well, then you can try and write out um, a coding solution. Um, your interviewer will very rarely ask you to go to the whiteboard and code. When you have figured out your solution, it will become clear to both of you that it's time to write the code. So you can ask them, you know, should I write the code now? Um, and they will say yes. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, that's that's it about coding. And um, they will also check your uh, your style. So uh, use a good coding style. That's important. Um, so that's details like um, coding style. Details like indentation. Details like variable and function naming, spacing. Um, Prepare to, to uh, code on a whiteboard. If you have trained on writing code on the whiteboard, as I said previously, you should leave some space to define your variables. You will get used to that so that your whole code is not crammed in a single line. So this makes a good impression, right? The code is readable. Now, uh, here I wrote without mistakes. Of course, it's impossible to, uh, to write perfectly good code in a Google interview, 
because the problems are usually difficult. So you will definitely make mistakes, but if you minimize your mistakes, that's good. However, at some point you may have a bug and your interviewer may say to you something like, oh, um, I think you have a bug. And then um, you will probably, you probably do have a bug if they say that. So you should st step back and look at your code and maybe um, run an example, right? Run a test case. Um, and you should run it out loudly, like say the input is such and such and go through your code and explain what you're thinking and see if you can find the mistake. Like debug it in the way that you would debug a real pro program, except this time you don't have a compiler and you don't have a debugger. And um, if you're stuck, you can freely ask your interviewer for a hint. You can say, I can't find my mistake, maybe you can give me a hint. Um, I think it would be arrogant to say, no, I don't have any mistakes, my code is right. Uh, something like that is kind of a red flag and I would not recommend it. Um, in general, uh, it's very important to talk through your solutions, uh, speak up, uh, speak through your, uh, your thought process and um, describe what you're thinking to your, uh, to your interviewer. Say, say the first thing that comes to mind and then try to improve it and see what they say to you and so on and so forth. Um, if you just sit there in silence and um, wait for your interviewer to speak or, or just think about the problem solution while your interviewer doesn't know what you're doing, this is not really illustrating anything to your interviewer. And then um, I think you should know these languages. So I think you should know C, C++, you should know some uh, Java, you should know some Python, and then you should also know some web languages. You should definitely know your um, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, and if you can, uh, if you can know, maybe if you have some bonus languages there, like maybe Go or some functional language uh, such as Haskell, these are bonus points. So um, these are quite popular languages, all of these, and you are expected to know them. Um, you will be allowed to code in any language of your choice, but um, different problems call for different solutions. So if you're asked a, a very um, clear algorithmic question, then C++ is very uh, good for this because you can use STL, the standard library, and all of the data structures that it offers. If you're asked a more like um, practical problem, you can use Java or Python, where you can write more concisely. If you're asked a problem about the web, you can code it in JavaScript. And sometimes a problem calls for a functional solution. And um, if you're asked a, a, a low-level question, like a security um, security secure coding question or uh, how to implement a data structure you can use C. So it's very good to know all of these languages so that you can use the, the one that is more appropriate for the problem. I, I recommend that um, you know all of these languages and you've written code in all of them. And one way to do this, one way to practice this is you can go to, to uh, this website projecteuler.net which has various very very simple problems and you can go ahead and uh, look at these problems. For example, problem one says um, it's like a, a like a very simple problem where it tells you look at the numbers uh, below one thousand that are multiples of three and five, and you should sum them up, right? And then once you log in here in, in the project or their website, you can submit your solution and see if it's right. So if you want to train in these languages, C, C++, Java, Python, JS. You can go ahead on Project Order and maybe solve the first 20 or 50 problems in uh, a language of your choice. And this will be uh, a good way to improve your basic skill in, in this particular language. That's it about the, the coding skill. It, um, they, they look to see if you have good, uh, good uh, coding abilities. And, um, well, of course, learning these languages at a basic level is good, but you should also know good general software engineering practices. And the way to improve that, as I will talk about in the design section as well, is to write actual production code. And I will I will get back to this. Now let's go, let's move on to the um, let's move on to the second kind of skill that is, and that that skill is um, algorithms. And um, so number two is algorithms. And um, let's see what kind of questions they ask. Um, I will talk about a, a wide variety of areas that you can uh, train in, you can improve in. 
And if you know all of these areas, then you will do well in your Google interview, and then you will do even better in interviews at other companies like Amazon. Um, so algorithms. In algorithms, this is standard, uh, standard stuff that you will do in a computer science undergraduate course of, of, of algorithm. So it will include graph algorithms. And then in graph algorithms, uh, you're expected to know things like um, searching. So the simplest thing you can do in graphs is like BFS and DFS. You will be expected to know some shortest path algorithms like uh, Dexter and um, like um, Bellman Ford and so on. They may not ask you about like specific algorithms, but if you if you know these things, you will have the prerequisites to solve any problem that comes um, comes along the way. So uh, it's it's good to know. They they may not ask you to implement Bellman Ford itself, but but if you know it, you know it has good techniques that that you can. Uh, you can um, rely on for solving any problem. Um, Floyd Warshall is another classical algorithm, and um, and then some maybe some um, some flow algorithms, some maximum flow algorithms like Ford Fulkerson. Um, these are good because uh, there's many problems that you can reduce to these. So if you've if you work with these ideas, you can say, oh, this problem is just a max flow problem, or this problem is just a shortest path problem on a graph, and so uh, you will be able to solve it easier just using standard tools. If you if you see a problem that is a standard algorithmic problem and you just try to solve it on your own without mentioning that, you know, it, oh, it has been solved by Floyd previously, this is kind of bad, right? Because um, we should know the literature and what has been done before. Um, now, uh, you should also know some uh, dynamic programming. And in dynamic programming, you're expected to know um, how to solve problems with, with dynamic programming and multiple dimensions, so say 1D, 2D, etc. And uh, you're also expected to be able to, to make like uh, correctness, ar correctness arguments for this. Uh, maybe not full formality proofs, but just to, to understand why is your algorithm correct. And of course to be able to write your, your recurrence relation. So your, your recurrence relation uh, is a mathematical tool to explain the correctness of your algorithm. And of course, um, you should also be able to approach problems greedily. Um, so that's one thing. And then, um, of course, you should know your data structures. These are useful tools. And if you know the right data structure, the problem becomes much, much easier. Um, some data structures that are useful are, of course, things like, you know, um, arrays, um, maps, um, queues, stacks, um, these are like the basics, but um, if you if you know some more advanced data structures, it will, will definitely help. So things like um, binary search trees or uh, self-balancing binary search trees like AVL trees and um, B trees, they may ask you like a database kind of question with B trees or B star trees, and then um, some more advanced data structures like uh, segment or binary index trees are much uh, very useful. Um, segment trees or uh, interval trees, let's say. Um, these are super useful, but uh, you may not necessarily need them. And then sometimes they, they ask like specialized questions. So if you, if you know some specialized data structures like KD trees, um, you can solve things like the map problem I uh, told you about before. Uh, so this is super useful, all kinds of you know, trees. And then the other kind of data structure that is quite useful is to know some string data structures. So things like tries, because if you are faced with a string problem, this will, this will be um, very valuable. And then um, some classical algorithms, like some classical algorithm techniques, I should say, like uh, string matching or uh, uh, the idea of a sliding window, these ideas are quite important um, to know as, as tools. So you should know these things. Um, and then of course, once you write your algorithm, you need to be able to analyze it from a complexity point of view. So from a complexity point of view, you need to know your computability and um, complexity classes. So just uh, basic stuff, not, not something very advanced. So like big O um, or like omega and theta. Um, 
you should know like what is NP complete, right? Um, if if you're given an NP complete problem, you should be able to argue, oh, you know, this is NP complete. Maybe I can reduce um, an NP complete problem that is standard NP complete to this. Uh, they don't usually ask these questions because they're a little bit more theoretical, but um, you should not attempt to, to solve an NP complete problem. Um, that is obvious, right? This is kind of a, a red flag as well. So this is the kind of algorithms that you're expected to know. And um, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff to take if you haven't seen these before. So I want to recommend a couple books. Uh, one is CLRS. And uh, CLRS is this book here. It's by um, MIT Press, and it's written by Corman Lasers and Revisenstein. And um, this is a big book. But if you know what it says, like, you know it covers all the things that I said, right? Sorting data structures, um, trees, you know, graphs, and then uh, various things like NP completeness, linear programming, and so on. And, and it's, it's a very useful book. So I don't know if you can read all of it because it's very large, but um, at least you should know what what it says inside. So this is uh, like a rule of thumb: uh, look at the topics that it covers and then try to learn them. Maybe you can learn them without looking at everything in the book. Maybe you can read some things in the book. It's a, it's a very well-written book. Uh, another book that covers almost the same things is the um, Vazirani book uh, called Algorithms. And um, this, is the, this is the book. It's by uh, Dasgupta, Vazirani, and Papa Dimitriou. And um, this, this book is uh, it's a good book. It's kind of shorter than CLRS. And it goes through the same topics. It's a little bit more concise. It's also very well written and highly recommended. So it goes through like number theory algorithms, uh, and graphs, and um, dynamic programming, and NP completeness, and so forth. So again, you know, if you know, if you know your algorithms, if you've gone through these book, these books, uh, you will not have a problem. And um, it's not enough to read these books, you have to also solve some problems. And uh, the, the Project Lawyer website that I mentioned previously has has quite harder problems. So if you go up to this problem, like uh, 161, this is a harder DP problem, for example. And it's, it's very good to train. So if you solve um, 100 or more problems of your choice from Project Lawyer, this is great. Um, two other good sites are Spodge, which has a lot of problems that are um, algorithm related. Um, you can choose the ones that you like and you can also filter them by topic. Uh, there's many indexing sites, but there's also tags here. So you can try and solve them. And the solutions that you submit to Spodge, they, are, uh, they need to be written in code. So it's not just a theoretical solution that you need to figure out, but you also need to write it out, which is very similar to your interview. So this is great for training for interviews. Another place is the Code Forces site. So Code Forces is also a site that has competitions and problems um, you should check it out it's it's good uh, there's there's other sites there's also there's also USACO training um, and um, yeah so uh, just go ahead and figure out which site is your favorite which one you like and um, you should be able to find some good problems and train in it so this will uh, this will improve your algorithm skills tremendously and uh, that's the second subject that you will be asked. So that's number two algorithms. Okay, uh, sounds good. So we've got algorithms out of the way. Let's see what else remains for the interview. The third thing that you will be assessed on, and that is design. So design in design, I think this is the most difficult one. And if you're interviewing, if you're doing a phone interview or a screen interview, you shouldn't worry about that yet, probably. They will not ask you that so much. And if you're an intern, or especially a step intern, then they will not ask you any design questions because you're not expected to know any design. Um, especially like right out of college, if you're applying for a graduate position or, or an internship, then these, these are gonna be easier. But if you're a veteran software engineer and you've worked in other companies before, then these are going to be quite more difficult. And um, of course, you're going to be asked more difficult design questions for a graduate position rather than an internship position. So yeah, that's uh, that's design. So what is this about? Well, design is about building large software. So building building production software, building large um, production software. 
And um, you have to, to be able to design a software from the bottom up and from the top down. So you, you want to be able to say, um, well, I guess maybe I can give an example. Like your interviewer may ask you uh, something like um, design um, Google Hangouts, right? Let me ask you something like that. What is Google Hangout? Well, the, the chat part of, of Google Hangouts, let's say. This is one of my favorite questions. And um, that's, so let's say, chat, right? <clears throat> so this is a very open-ended question. Um, of course, you can't code up Google Hangouts in 45 minutes. It's a huge project, and there's tens of thousands of people working on that, or maybe thousands of people working on, on Gmail and Hangouts. And so... Um, Obviously, you're not expected to do their job in 45 minutes, but um, you're expected to be able to to uh, build the system like in your mind, top down, right? So you should say, okay, if I want to make Google Hangouts, then that will require like a client sitting here. You don't have to write like UML; it's this is just a sketch. So this is like the browser, and then this is the Google server and they communicate with like HTTP, right? And then how do you do that? Well, this is the client, I write a client and I write a server and they talk to each other. So you need to be able to describe this protocol and go through the design of the software with your interviewer. So uh, you will start talking about how you would approach this problem on, uh, and then your interviewer will guide you to a correct direction. So you'd say, okay, I have a, a client and server and they may ask you, okay, how do you build up the server? And you can say, okay, I, I can use the MVC pattern. And that's another thing in the design interview. You may be asked to use different software patterns. The um, this is a good book, the Gang of Four um, book, right? Uh, is is a good book on design patterns. Um, but if you come from um, from a, a software engineering background of large languages like Java, you, then you'll be familiar with these. Uh, but this, this is a good read. Um, but most of these you can't get from a book. You get them from building actual software. And so you can say, okay, I will have MVC, and then um, they will ask you, oh, what is MVC? You know, and you can say, oh, I'll have models and views and controllers. And then um, they may ask you, okay, what kind of models will you have? And you can say, oh, um, I will have a chat message, and that will be one model. And then I will have also... Um, I will have like a user maybe and then I will have also maybe like a, a conversation so that we can have like group chats and that will be exciting right and um, the, the interviewer may ask you okay what what fields will the user have and you can say okay we'll, we'll have a username and they, they may guide you to this location to do this like to this part of the design process where you design the DBMS, right? The, D, the DB, not the DBMS, but the DB schema, right? Um, and you're here and you're designing your um, your ontology of the application. You're building tables and you're building uh, fields, and that's um, that's it, right? And they may ask you what kind of what kind of normal forms may there be, or, or what kind of foreign keys will you have or what kind of primary keys or indices will you have and how how will you be able to like do this quickly and search through the messages or or they may ask you like um, a, a question to see if you have a good view of what the software is doing from um, from a high level point of view so they may ask you okay the client now goes to gmail.com they enter this in their browser and they open up a chat window what happens and then you can describe that. Can you describe that? Can you describe what happens in every step? What happens in, in the client here? What code runs here? What code runs on the network? What code runs on the server? What code runs on the database? You should be able to do that, right? You, you should be able to say, oh, the server communicates with a database and they speak a protocol and that protocol is a SQL protocol, right? Uh, for example, it could be MySQL, right? And um, you should be able to say, okay, how does MySQL index things? Um, Maybe not specific implementation details, but you should know that uh, oh, it uses some sort of trees, right, or some hash maps, and um, and then they may add more difficult questions to this problem. They may say, okay, you have you have too many users for this to be one web server. You need to add more. 
you need to have more web servers. How do you do that? And then you can describe some scalability solutions. You can say, I'm putting a load balancer here in front of that, and it's talking to all these web servers, and then all of these are talking to various DB slaves of MySQL, which are talking to one DB master, and they're using some, some sort of propagation. So um, this is software design, right? Uh, how do these speak to each other? Um, they may ask you, oh, is this protocol secure? Is this encrypted? Right? How do we make it secure? That kind of question is what you should expect in a software design, um, in the software design question. And um, the thing that they want to see here is if you, if you can design good software, if you can lead a team of software engineers, if you have good design principles, but not encoding individual lines, but in designing large software systems. So can you do multi-tire design? Can you do orthogonality? Can you do separation of concerns? Can you um, separate your components in a way that they can be assigned to different teams? So in this case, we have the server component and the client component, and we can split it up into two teams of, of different engineers. This, these can code in like React or Angular, and these guys can code in like Python and Django. So this is good, good to know. And um, if you are going in for an advanced interview, they may ask you even some estimation questions about how many people will it take to, to do that and how much money do you need and how, how long will it take to build such a system. And you should be able to provide a, like a back of the envelope estimation of um, how long the system will take. And of course, in, in these, you should also ask questions like, how many users do you plan to have in this system? Is, is one load balancer enough here? or will the load balancer also be overloaded and you need multiple load balancers that are managed by some other technique like round robin DNS or some, some different idea, right? So you should always keep asking questions about scalability, about the user base, about what kind of speed requirements do we have? Is this a real-time chat or is this like a forum? Because if it's a real-time chat, then maybe this kind of connection here needs to be a, uh, like a web socket, right? So this is, this is a different design. Um, the other things you will be asked to talk about is network protocols and how they work. How does DNS work here? How does HTTP work here? How does SSL and TLS work? And how does WebSockets work? Um, yeah, and then maybe you will be asked to optimize some things. So if you design a normalized DB schema, you may be asked to, to denormalize. So these are all kinds of things that you can be asked to do. And I can't really put my finger on what kind of things they ask because each interviewer is different and uh, they like different things and they may ask you any part of the software they may ask you about uh, for example like do you want to use UDP here if this client is like a, a desktop client you would you use UDP like that's a network question and then you can explain what it is or um, they may ask you about compression would would you use a compression method right that's all there's all sorts of questions that they can ask you at this stage um, okay so so these are the um, this this really sums up the interview, and um, I want to say, let's just go back to like the um, the uh, the three core um, three core areas again, and um, just do an overview. So we said you need coding, you need um, algos, and you need um, you need software design. And um, what you will see is usually. Um, the first two questions are grouped together, right? So um, they may ask you an algorithm question and expect you to code it. So they may say something like the, the um, points on the map problem that I said before. You're given a map with uh, X and Y coordinates like that, and you're seeing some, some um, points here. And they're given in, like, uh, in their coordinates. And then um, this is a big, like, big... Uh, list of points, but they're static, and then you're given a point somewhere, and you need to find like the k closest neighbors, right? This is a classical algorithm problem, and uh, you will be expected to solve the problem in a fast fashion. Use the proper data structures, and um, you know, code it up. Um, I mean, um, not code it up, but rather uh, design it from an algorithmic point of view so that it's fast and analyze its complexity, and then. Um, you will be asked to code it in your language of choice, like C++, and you will be asked to write real code. So this could be like a 45-minute question. And if you do well, they may they may change the problem, and they may say, oh, actually, you know, this is given in lat latitudes and longitudes, whatever, 
or uh, now it, it's uh, it's like a 3D 3D space of, uh, of points and then you have to solve the same problem and they, they may change a problem like that it's, it's quite common um, it, it means you're doing well because they keep asking more questions so you solve the previous one and you ask more and um, a lot of this algo stuff also involves uh, some discrete mathematics and probabilities so it's, it's good to have uh, some basic background in math um, I would say just discrete and uh, probabilities that's it's very good to know uh, in addition to your algorithms and complexities um, they may even ask you to do like a, a, a simple probabilities proof and then um, this is going to be the one 45 minute question and then the design question is going to be a different question so a different interviewer will ask you your design question and that's going to be another 45 minutes so uh, as I said you will get five interviews meaning you'll get maybe like three coding and algorithms questions and two design questions something like that or maybe you get two and two uh, like two coding and algorithms questions and two design questions and then what question is more specialized so it could be uh, a probability proof or maybe it could be like a, a security interview where they show you some code and they tell you oh do you see a security mistake in this code um, depending on on uh, what the interviewer wants to ask you um, yeah, so that sums up the different questions that could be asked. Well, I hope you like this video and that you learned something about uh, how big companies conduct software interviews. As you saw through the video, it's not possible to fake your performance in the interview because they ask you all sorts of things and you should really know how to develop software. So the best strategy for getting through one of these interviews is to just know how to write code and how to solve algorithmic problems and how to design software. And um, in addition to reading the books that I uh, mentioned, I think one of the best ways to, to get up to speed is to spend several months or maybe a couple of years um, writing software for open source projects and contributing to open source projects. If you spend one year working on an open source project, you will have the chance to work with more experienced people that will show you how to properly design software and how to write good quality uh, code. And uh, of course you should choose a project that has good practices and good leaders. And there's many out there that you can uh, choose from. You can just go on GitHub, click on Explore, find a project that is in the programming language of your choice or that you personally use and you can go ahead and write a small patch and go from there. Um, now uh, another way that I would recommend you train is ask a friend who is more experienced than you or even someone who has worked for a larger company to do a mock interview for you. So sit together and tell them to ask you questions about, um, about your skills, right? Uh, explain to your friend that you would like to interview for a big company and uh, tell her to mock the interview for you. Tell her to ask you specific questions as they would if they were conducting an interview for their company. So tell them to give you an algorithmic problem or a software design problem without spoiling the solution and try to assess you and to give you some feedback. That would be great for uh, seeing what you're missing in terms of knowledge, but also it will help reduce your stress before the actual interview. Well, I hope these are some good tips and uh, good luck with your interview. If you found these tips helpful, please thumbs up. And if you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe. And if you have questions about the interview process or anything else, don't forget to leave a comment in the section below. Now, till next time, so long.